getting up early for? Hello? Somebody left a clock up here for me. I don't know if that's a hint or something like that. Maybe it's a blood pressure cup. I'm <laughs> well, I'm glad you got out of bed and got away from the rain and forgot about spring break. I tell you, this is one of those triple hair Sundays when everything's just there and you're at church and praise the Lord, I believe it will be well worth your time. I want to make an announcement. I mentioned this last week, but in the bulletin you'll see this little card. Many of you in the church have already been through Evangelism Explosion training. Now, this is one of the greatest little tools in the world to help you in your Christian walk. If you're wanting to know how to be an effective witness for the Lord Jesus Christ, just attend this class. About six or seven weeks long, we're going to have a kickoff lunch and explaining everything on March the 24th. And then the first session will start on April 1st. By the way, it's just, it is the best of the best of the best on how to win people to Jesus Christ. You just need this tool, all right, in your tool bag of spiritual gifts. And so God, God will really... I, I, for lack of better words, you, this will transform your life. It really will. There's many of you who, uh, whenever we mention uh, and talk about in our sermons or services and Bible studies about being a witness and being effective and teaching and reaching and ministering to people, you kind of feel cramped. You just are not quite sure. Maybe you just don't feel like equipped. No more excuses. No more excuses. You told the Lord at the beginning of this year you want to make this the best year ever. You want to be everything God wants you to be. Come get equipped. These are, this is just a, like seven lessons that will transform your life. All right, Robbie Amalgamar is going to be teaching. He's here today. He's in the middle of the service. Raise your hand, Robbie, if you want to ask him a question right afterwards. Or if you'll just fill this out, he'll contact you this week sometime and answer any question you might have. If you want to take it, you know you want to take it, fill this out for sure so we can get you on the list. Or if you just want more information, fill this out. Take a moment. The devil does not want you to touch this piece of paper. Some of you have already experienced that. You open the bullet, it's all evangelism and Kind of put it off like that. It won't bite, all right? It's a lovely shade of green. It's inviting. So be, take, be sure and come be a part of this class. It'll, it will transform your, your testimony, your walk with God. Amen? I'm looking for all the parts and stuff I've got up here and never got the right things. All right. We're in our series of messages, number three, by the way. Did Pastor Strickland do all, I, all right last week? All right. Got to, got to check up on him every once in a while. Did you post his sermon yet so I can watch it and critique it? Get it up so I can check on him, all right? But praise the Lord for faithful brothers in Christ, amen, you can leave things with. Um, I am excited today because we're continuing this series of messages on, on evangelism, and this is, I mean, on, on, on the miracles of Jesus, and last week it was about, the week before last, it was about uh, being evangelistic and Jesus calling those men to become fishers of men, and how that call really extends to every child of God to be fishers of men and that we should fulfill that purpose. And as we've talked about, we're laying these miracles out in, in a chronological type of order as, as much as possible, you know, as much as we can tell by taking the four Gospels and lining them up and looking at where Jesus was at certain times and what cities and what was going on there. So try to lay these out chronologically for you. But this would be about the third miracle in, in this whole series. I'm sure we'll miss one or two here in the, in the whole process. But this is the one about the man who, was a, who, who has four faithful friends who put him on a pallet. He's paralyzed, and they bring him to the Lord Jesus Christ. It's the third in our series. And we're going to be looking in Scripture in the book of Mark, chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. I'll have it on the screen so you can follow along if you like. But in chapter 2, it says, And when he had come back to Capernaum several days afterward, it was heard that he was at home. By the way, the King James Version says that he was in the house. All right? Some of you are talking about Elvis being in the house, Jesus in the house. All right? And many were gathered together. So that there were no longer room, even near the door, and he was speaking the word to them. And they came, bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men. And being unable to get to him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. And when they had dug an opening, they let down the pallet on which the paramedic land was laying. And Jesus, seeing their faith, said to the paralytic, My son, your sins are forgiven you. Now, again, I'll kind of look at this a little bit verse by verse this morning as we go through this and lay some things out that I think are important that we kind of catch. And there's a few points I really want to drive home today from this message because I really believe that there is a word from this word to every one of us today. That we need to hear it, we need to grasp it, we need to remember it. So we'll, we'll also want to deal with the, 
the, the, the issues of what's going on and where this is happening, because it is at Capernaum. It's the same area where Jesus has been speaking and calling the fishermen to himself. This is where Peter and Andrew have been. And, and it says in this verse, and after some days it was heard that he was at home. Now, the, it said the King James says that he was in the house. He's entered Capernaum, and after some days, in fact, it looks as though it, with the ministry of Jesus beginning, that Capernaum is becoming the headquarters for his, for his ministry in the Galilee area, that this is where he's going to operate from and he's going to remain and do his earthly ministry for a period of about three years. But there, in the King James, it, this just translates that he was in the house, and the Greek word there literally, it's not giving my subtitles, you're going to have to help me out for some reason. Would you back that up and hit the two subtitles for me? It says the, there's this little Greek word there that's the, and when it says he was in the house, it's really, it's an adjective to explain a house. In fact, he's talking about a definite, particular home that he, that he is in. So the question kind of comes at this point, what house is he talking about? Which house is he dealing with here? And I believe the answer is, uh, is found, if you look closer in the first chapter, it says that after he'd been to the synagogue that morning, that he entered into the house of Simon and Andrew. So I believe the house and the house that he's at, Obviously, kind of from the context of the scripture, we're talking about the house of Simon and Andrew where he begins to take up the ministry that he's going. And so the word gets around that Jesus is back there. He's, he's seen the miracle that's taken place where the, where the fish is. You know in this fishing community the, on the Sea of Galilee, the word's gotten out. And, but not only that, he's already been preaching quite a bit. And people are coming to hear the word of God. In fact, in verse 2 it says, And many were gathered together so that there was no longer room, even near the door, and he was speaking the word to them. Underline that. He was speaking the word to them. Again, it's going to be the same kind of problem. Back it up there. And the idea here is that if you're not careful, you kind of miss these, these gospels, and people get the idea that Jesus came to do miracles. Jesus came to preach the Word of God. He came to minister the Word of God. He came to be the Word of God in flesh in our presence. So uh, Jesus did a lot of miracles, and we're talking about the miracles of Jesus. But it, you will notice with each of these miracles, it always begins with this little emphasis that he's there and he's doing something as a primary purpose for what he's doing. And the primary purpose that he's doing there is to preach the Word of God. It's not the miracles. That wasn't what he wanted to characterize him. That wasn't what he wanted to, to be the main emphasis. He didn't come to be a miracle worker. Remember, those miracles were all signs. They were all evidence that he is the Lord of glory. It wasn't the miracles that were supposed to uh, kind of identify him. It was the message that, wanted, that was to identify him. What he did come to do was to preach the Word of God. And what he did come to do was to fulfill the Word of God. In other words, he came to die on the cross. He came to give us life, a ransom for many. Everything that the Old Testament said he would do is what he came to do. And when he came to do it, he came preaching the Word of God. That's our number one responsibility. People so easily get sidetracked with the supernatural in the world we live in. I mean, everybody gets all uh, up and excited and pumped up about miracles. And hey, Miracles are wonderful. I believe God still does miracles. But the greatest thing of all that Jesus came to do and that he's given us to do is to take the word of God and lay it open before the world around us so that they see Jesus, who is the living word of God. That's the ministry of the Lord Jesus. And boil it down to a little tiny nutshell for you and I. That is our ministry. We're here to speak, to preach, and to live the Word of God to everybody around us. Now, verse 4 goes on to say, And when they came unto him, bringing one sick of palsy, which was born of four, and when they could not come nigh unto him for the press, they uncovered the roof where he was, and when they had broken it up, they let down the bed wherein the sick of palsy lay. Okay, now get the picture here. It's in Capernaum. Jesus is there in the house. Everybody wants to come hear him talk, so the place is packed full. It's poured over into the streets. So much so and so deeply were people in front of the house, you couldn't get to the door of the house. Now, there's some men here. Four guys, this little quartet of men, you can almost see them, you know, coming from the outside of the parts of the village somewhere. And they've heard that this Jesus who's preaching the word of God, he is a unique individual. In fact, they've heard the miracles. They've also heard the message. 
In fact, the Bible says he didn't speak and teach like other men. He spoke as one with authority. So there's something unique about Jesus, so much so that they feel their friend can be helped by Jesus, or perhaps we don't have all the details. Maybe the friend has put the pressure on the four friends to come and help him get to Jesus. We don't really know all the details there, but nonetheless, you see him coming down the road, you know, each guy on the corner of that pallet, carrying it to the, to the place, excited to get this man, their friend, to Jesus to see what God could do for their friend. Now, when they get there, bummer. Disappointment rises, you know, discouragement kind of enters there. You can't get to him. This ain't going to happen. A lot of folks at this point probably just give up. I don't guess it must, it must not have been the Lord's will. So they come up with a plan. They, they have their own little business meeting of sorts, and they say, well, what are we going to do here? And one guy says, hey, I know where the stairway is to the roof. It's always, these homes all had stairwells that led up to the roof, and sometimes people would, you know, live on the roof. Some of these homes were constructed so as to put a couple of stories on them. So they get up to the roof, and there they decide, you know, uh, and if they were Baptists, it's a miracle they ever came to a unanimous decision. But anyway, <laughs> they get up to the roof, and they decided to let this man down into the midst right where Jesus is preaching. Now, apparently, Peter's not around to stop him. Because if they're tearing up the roof of my house, something's going to give. You know, we're, we're, I don't know what's going to happen here. Now, the, the construction, then, you know, you can study the, the, the architectural construction of the day. It, either tiles or clay and sand and grass and stuff. A lot of different materials they would use to, to, to construct roofs depending on the area that you lived in. But whatever it was, it says they dug it out. They cleared it away and made a hole big enough for, for letting this man down into the presence of Jesus. Can you imagine the stir of that? Here's everybody down here, and all of a sudden you're out here, and you can see what's going on. And you're thinking, what in the world are these guys doing? What are they up to? Well, they're busily working, and they have one thing on mind, and that's to get this guy down to where Jesus is. And you, you know that Jesus is probably, he's standing there. Of course, he knows all things. And all of a sudden, while he's speaking and teaching, you talk about a distraction. You know, some of you guys are distracting enough. But can you imagine, you know, you're sitting here and you're trying to communicate to the crowd that's there and all of a sudden here comes dust and tiles and stuff are start falling around you and it's getting smoke in the air and clearing it all out. And all of a sudden here comes this pallet being lowered down by a rope right before you and right in your presence. Now this is, this is what's happening. This isn't a fairy tale, all right? This is really taking place. They're tearing somebody's house up, you know, just to get somebody down through the roof to, you know, to get him into the presence of Jesus. Now, verse 5 puts it this way. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said unto the paralyzed man, the sick of palsy, Son, thy sins be forgiving thee. Now, didn't stop Jesus. It's almost like in stride. He's just kind of going with the flow. It doesn't tell us what he's preaching on, but apparently it makes a great illustration. And so it's happening there, and it's being lowered down, and here Jesus, you know, he just, he just stays right at the flow and he looks up, sees the guy coming down and speaks these simple words to him. Jesus, seeing their faith, said, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. Now, there are some Bible verses in Scripture that kind of give me a little bit of a pause at different times and you have to go a little deeper in and you have to, to study a little bit for. In fact, this one kind of disturbed me for, for a few years when I looked at this verse. It, it seemed to me that it, was, that it was the, as you read it, it was the faith of these men that was, was responsible for this guy's sins being forgiven. You know, but and I try to hold that up to the rest of Scripture. And, and that, that's the way you study Scripture, by the way, is, you know, if it seems a little out of context, then you weigh it against the rest of Scripture, and you eventually, you will come to a resolution because the Bible never will contradict itself. What I'm saying here, it wasn't the faith of these men that caused this man's sins to be forgiven. In fact, this issue about faith is, you know, it has to be personal. And you study Scripture, and over and over again in Scripture, it tells us it's not people's individual faith. Go back to it and give me those subtitles again. All right. It's not these, these, these men's corporate faith in lowering him that, that, that has him experience this, this experience of having his sins forgiven and, and eventually experiencing a physical healing. But it's the idea here that, that Jesus is speaking to this particular man and his particular 
faith experience. Your faith has made you. He makes it personal here. He's not speaking in the whole to, to the group here. Thy sins be forgiven thee, is what he says. In other words, if you're going to experience your sins being forgiven thee, you, then you're going to have to commit yourself to the Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, me having faith is good for me, but I can't cover you with my faith. You know, I, I have a godly mother, but her faith didn't cause me to be saved, didn't result in my salvation. Oh, maybe in a kind of a sense that she prayed, she believed, she preached, she taught me the Word of God. But ultimately, I had to make a commitment myself. I had to exert my heart's faith, commitment to Jesus Christ before I would be saved. Nobody can be saved for you, all right? You may have had a, a godly parent, a grandparent. You may have a godly family. I, I talk to people a lot. They say, you know, I ask them, how do you know that you know you know Jesus? Oh, I, I've been a Christian all my life. Well, nobody's been a Christian all their life. Just because you had your diapers changed in the church nursery doesn't mean you're a believer. And they may have been changed by a believer's caring hands. But that did not sanctify you. You may have been around godly people all your life. You may have gone to a, you may have been a member of a lot of different churches. All right? You may have joined the Catholics and the Methodists and the Baptists and the Episcopalians and the Presbyterians and all the other Arians. But it doesn't make you a believer until you join by your own personal heart's decision and faith, you join Jesus Christ. You receive him personally in your life. There's this personal exertion, there's this personal repentance, there's this personal commitment. You have to be the believing. It's not the faith of the four men that save you. It's the faith, you know, that may of others that can bring you to a place. These men had a, an, an idea and a belief that Jesus could do something. They got him to a place, but ultimately, Jesus dealt personally with a man when he said, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. Has that ever happened? Oh, well, Brother Joe, I've just been content to, you know, uh, I've known about God all my life. Well, folks, there's a lot of people dead and in hell today who've known about God all their life. In fact, the Bible says the devil believes, and he trembles. You don't have to convince him there's a God. You don't have to convince the, the, the devil that the Bible's real. He hates the Word of God. He trembles at it. You don't have to convince the devil that Jesus is the Lord of glory. He knows that, but he's not going to heaven. He's not going to be at the wedding feast. Somebody say amen for that. <laughs> he's not going to be there, and nor is anyone who has not committed their own heart and their own life to Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior. I'm a pastor. That being a pastor didn't save me. Give my life to Jesus, save me. My children are PKs. Y'all know PKs, all right? Preacher kids but they're not saved because they're PKs. They're saved because they personally made a decision to give their heart and their life to Jesus Christ. Don't mess this up, <clears throat> because you'd be surprised how many people just mess right in. They miss it completely. I, 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 I go to church. I'm a religious person. I pray prayers. I've been baptized. I've been sprinkled. I've been confirmed. I've been accepted by the body. Hey, if you've not trusted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you're in for a very rude and crude awakening. Amen? Four things I want you to catch from this. In fact, a couple of things here, more than that, really. Well, about 4,000 things, but we'll, we won't make it that long. But as, as you look at Jesus in this whole scenario, watch what he's doing and see how he's responding to this, to this whole situation and just how he deals with everything that's going on. Because if you see it through the eyes of Jesus, you see that he sees more than what we see. First of all, he saw the obvious. There's a bunch of noise going over his head. There's a bunch of commotion that's taking place. And so the Bible says, you know, he looked up and he saw the four men on the roof with their friend lowering the man down. So Jesus is looking up. And as he's looking up, he sees these four men with their sick friends. Remember, the roofs were flat in those days, and they were accessible by the means of the stairwell. So these guys have gotten up there, and they've made this opening big enough to get this pilot, pilot down, down there where, where, in the presence of Jesus with their friend. Now, as Jesus looks up, he sees the four. He also sees the paralytic men. In a moment, we'll see how he looks directly at the paralytic men. But he's looking up, and he's seeing this, this thing going on. And what does he notice? He notices four men. And there's several things about these four men I think you have to admire about them and about their character and about their life. Three things, really. One is their devotion. You look at these, three guy, these four guys, and they come on the scene carrying their friend, and they're deeply concerned about their friend. They're devoted. 
They, they care about it. There's, there's a passion to get this man to Jesus, their friend who needs help. And in fact, they're, they're, they're so committed to him that they're willing to do anything that it takes. He may be heavy. He may not be heavy. He may have to carry him upstairs. It doesn't matter. We have to tear off the roof. It doesn't matter. They care about this man's life. And in them and in their hearts, they genuinely believe that Jesus can do something about it. What we need in the church is men and women and young people who care about other people. We're living in such a culture that it's, it has almost infected the church with this attitude of, of, of no passion and no caring about other people. And we, we, we say we care, but if we never reach out and we never care enough to, to make a difference in their life, to bring them to church, to invite them to Christ, to share the gospel with them, how can we really say we care? I mean, for God so cared, God so loved that he gave his only begotten son. I believe if we have this kind of devotion these men have, Jesus had, and I think he's admiring their devotion because he came at all costs, difficulty, strife, having to deal with the devil, having to deal with sin. He came, devoted. What drove him was love. And what he's looking for in our lives is the same kind of attitude and the same kind of commitment based on a passion about other people. We need to care. And if you're sitting there and say, well, I, I care, but I just don't know how. That's why you need to be a part of the evangelism explosion class. That gives you an opportunity to show that if there's that passion that's burning in your heart to help people and to make a difference, <clears throat> no longer use an excuse of not knowing how. Come be a part of this. Learn. But not only, uh, I'm sorry, I did it again. Not only was their devotion, it was their, their discernment. He sees their devotion, and he sees it. He said, what's so discerning about these guys? They believed. They had enough wisdom, insight, and understanding to believe <coughs> if they got their friend to Jesus, that Jesus could do something. How about you? Do you have that kind of discernment? Do you believe that if you could get your friends to Jesus, that Jesus could make a difference in their life? He certainly can. And I believe when Jesus looks up and he sees, their, sees these men with their devotion and discernment, that it moves his heart, but also their dedication. This was not an easy task. There's, there's, from the moment they start, there's problems. You can't get near the door. The crowd's too big. How are we going to get to Jesus? They didn't give up. They didn't, they didn't make excuses. They didn't rationalize the situation and come up with, well, you know, we'd like to, but it's not going to be easier. It's going to be more difficult than we thought. Things are going to be a, we got a roof, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I, I, I'm, I might mess up and, you know, what if I drop a roof tile on Jesus and, you know, all the rationalizations and excuses that people can come up with, they weren't looking for them. So when Jesus looks up, he sees their devotion, he sees their discernment, he sees their dedication. But not only looked up, the Bible says he was, the man was lowered down. And when the man is lowered down, it says that Jesus saw the man. And he saw the man and where was he? The man was... On the pallet, now lowered down to the presence of Jesus Christ. Again, can you imagine that moment? You're sitting there speaking to a community of people, and all of a sudden, here's this guy being lowered in your presence. And Jesus looks down at him, and what, what does he say to him? Well, he addresses the problem in the man's life. And what was the problem? He said he's paralyzed. That's not the problem. The problem Jesus deals with is sin. Now, I don't know if that's interesting to you, but that certainly got me sparked up a little bit. Now, some people take that and say, well, <clears throat> what's happening here is that uh, people need to be healed, and the reason they can't be healed and the reason they're sick is because they've got sin in their life. Well, there's other places. In fact, we're going to look at another miracle a few weeks from now where Jesus heals a man, and he says that the man was sick, but it wasn't due to sin. All right? So there is some sickness that's a result of sin, and then there's some maladies that are not a result of sin. How do you know the difference? Well, God knows the difference, and he's the one that counts. Is that right? And I believe an individual can know the difference. I believe if you're a child of God, the Holy Spirit will show you the difference. Amen? I, I, you know, in fact, if, when I get sick, first thing I do is start confessing my sin. That doesn't work. I confess Kathy's and yours and anybody else. <laughs> get me well soon. Amen? The idea is this Jesus knows. I mean, he looks right in this man's heart, and he deals with the heart of the problem. In this man's situation, the heart of the problem is his sin, and so Jesus looks down. And by the way, don't miss this. This is a great miracle, but the greatest miracle that's being performed here is the forgiveness of sins. There's no greater miracle than that. If you've experienced forgiveness of sins, that is the greatest miracle. That's the reason Jesus died, 
so that you could experience that forgiveness in full and complete and total in your life, that your sins could be forgiven, that everything you'd ever done wrong in your life at any time, in any moment, in, you know, in, in haste or in planning or whatever, whatever the format, whatever the situation, you sin can be forgiven by the grace of God. It's a miracle that, you know, we, we, we see these things like this paralytic being healed. We've seen people healed in our own church. We've seen miracle things happen in people's lives and God providing miraculously for someone's needs. But think about this for a moment. How powerful and how supernatural it is when you can be one way in personality and in, in heart, you know, in reality, when God looks at you, he sees somebody who's failed him and resisted him and rebelled against him and maybe even cursed him at times, you know, and, and see a heart so dirty and so filthy and so sinful and so filled with selfishness, bitterness, and all the things that cloud our hearts and lives. And then in, in, in a moment, the grace of God intervenes and moves into that man's life, and every sin is completely taken away. Every sin which you are accountable for, that you personally are responsible for, every sin is forgiven. Bam! The Bible says, if any man's in Christ, he's a new creation, new creature. You're not watching. That's a miracle. There's no explanation for that. It's the glory of God. The greatest of all miracles. So even if the man doesn't get up, which he does, if he doesn't give up, it's supernatural. As one preacher put it this way, it meets the greatest need, it costs the greatest price, it brings the greatest blessing and the most lasting results. Well, you couldn't put it much better than that, amen? It meets the greatest need. What's the greatest need? His, his, his legs to work and operate, paralysis? No, his greatest need is an eternal need, and it's his soul. Your greatest need today, you may think it's a man or a woman or, or healing or money or what. Hey, your greatest need today is, is for Jesus Christ to transform your life from the inside out. And if you don't have that, then you don't have life. And the Lord looks down. The third thing the Lord does is he looks not just up and down, he looks around. And as he looks around, he sees the critics who'd come to spy on him. These are the religious leaders, all right? And it is certainly their task to come and examine the ministry of Jesus. They're the ones who are supposed to be looking for the Messiah anyway, all right? These are the Pharisees. These are the spiritual experts of the land. They're the theologians. And they have been given... All these passages in the Old Testament about a coming redeemer, a Messiah, someone who would give us life, someone who would lay down his life, someone who would come and lead the people to life and life eternal. They're supposed to be examining anybody who steps on the scene that might be the Messiah. But when Jesus looks at him, these men, he doesn't see men who come with open hearts and open minds seeking truth. Instead, they come with critical hearts and critical minds and critical spirits. They miss they miss it completely because of their own sinfulness, because of their own selfishness, because of their own arrogance. You know, there's still people like that today. They come to church and they just miss it. You know, uh, they just miss it completely. I, I, I've seen people I, I walk out of a glorious service where God's been moving people's hearts and lives and people have been changed. And, and, and then somebody walks out talking about what somebody else was wearing. Or a note that didn't get sung right. Or the preacher didn't have his, had a misspelled word in his PowerPoint presentation. The Lord looks around as well, all right? The Lord examines our hearts and sees if we're really coming with hearts of worship and hearts of humility and hearts of gratitude. Are we just coming to come and kind of look at everything and, you know, be the judge and the jury? instead of the congregation of God's holy people who are hungry for God to do something. The Lord looks around. What's he see today in your heart when he looks around? And even more than that, the, we see that the Lord looked within because it says he knew their hearts. He knew what was going on in their minds. All right? And this is where they, what ticked them off was that Jesus told the paralytic, your sins are forgiven. They know. They're theologically sound enough to know that there's only one who can forgive sins, and that is God. And so that when Jesus says your sins are forgiven, boy, that, gets, uh, that gets the hair on the back of their neck, their theological neck up. Because Jesus is basically saying, I'm God. I can forgive your sins. God's the only one that can forgive our sins. And so when Jesus does that to them, he's basically making an announcement. Hey, the Messiah's here. 
The Christ is here. The chosen one is here. They don't want to hear that. They didn't want to receive that. The Lord looks within, and he knew exactly what was going on in their heart and mind. But let me tell you this, the Lord looks within this morning. And you need to understand that the Lord is the only one that can make a difference in your life. The Lord is the only one that can change your heart. The only one that can change your attitude. Sometimes, you know, as believers, we just get this corrupt little stinking attitude that keeps us from really enjoying the Lord, enjoying fellowship, and enjoying what God's doing in our life. Sometimes we get so defeated because we see, you know, things we're praying about perhaps and things we want God to do. We don't see it happening on the surface yet, and we get disappointed and discouraged. And maybe we, become, we get a little embittered with God because it didn't turn out the way we want it to turn out. And God sees what's going on in your heart and life. You, you simply need to come back to that place of humility and recognize the fact, a simple fact, that God's God and you're not. And God knows what's going on. And though you cannot see what's happening, perhaps in the hearts of your children or your husband or your wife, God knows what's going on there. You've got to trust Him. You've got to believe Him. He's faithful. He's trustworthy. Keep embracing him. Keep trusting him. Don't let him look into your heart and see a heart of unbelief. Now, we might not see that in each other, but if it's there, I can trust you, God sees it. Because there's nothing hid from his eyes. There's two miracles that are taking place here. The first miracle is simple. It's a miracle of grace, all right? We think the first miracle is the paralysis being healed. No, the first miracle is a miracle of grace, and that's where the Lord touches this man, and he heals, you know, his heart first. The weight of sin. In fact, the weight of sin, folks, can be more binding than the weight of this paralysis in this man's life. And far better to be forgiven of my sins and have to deal with a paralysis or an illness or something for the rest of my life until one day when it's all laid off and I'm in glory forever, all right, with no sickness, no sin, no death, no diseases whatsoever. Better to endure it for a time. This man gets a, a double blessing, so to say. The first is this miracle of grace. Your sins are forgiven. That's good news. I don't know what's in his heart and mind, but you know Jesus does. He's looking down that man. He says, your sins are forgiven. I can imagine the biggest grin and tears filled his eyes. I don't know what his sin was. I bet he knew. You know he knew. You know he was humbled. You know he's broken. You know when he stands in the midst of the glorious presence of Jesus Christ, it's like Peter on that boat we talked about last week. Oh, I'm a sinful man. Lord, depart from me. And what great words to hear. Your sins are forgiven, son. If you hadn't heard those words, I don't know how you keep pressing forward. Your sins, you're right with God. You're right with God. And so that when someone comes and says, how do you know you're right with God? Say, hey, I just know my sins are forgiven. Jesus spoke to my heart, my sins are forgiven. I've trusted him. I'm not telling God, well, I know I'm a Christian because I joined the church. I know I'm a Christian because I prayed a prayer. I got baptized. I was sprinkled at seven. <laughs> I know I'm a believer. I put my faith in Jesus. And the weight of the world rolled off of my shoulders. The weight of sin. David the psalmist says, my sins have gone over my head and they are much too heavy for me to bear. Only one removes them. And that's those precious words of Jesus when grace is administered to your life because you put your faith in him. The second is that miracle of healing in a physical sense. But that's always second. We try to make it first, don't we? It's second. It's not the primary. Let me, let me wrap it up here real quick. What we need in the church, number one is this. People who are willing to be faithful friends like these four guys were. We need some stretcher bearers. Anybody here willing to be a stretcher bearer? Anybody here believe God's big enough to change your friends' hearts and lives? Anybody here willing enough to go take the friends and their loved ones to Jesus? To bring them to church? To take them to that place where they hear the gospel? To pray for them? And when you can't physically take them there, you're spiritually taking them there in prayer. What we need is some stretcher bearers. I pray, if you haven't been a stretcher bearer, that you'd ask God to forgive you first and then volunteer yourself to the throne of heaven and say, I'm willing to be made willing to work in my heart and life. I just, I, I, I want to have the faith that this not content to sit in church and say, thank you for saving me, the kind of faith that compels me to go out and make a difference in other people's lives. Listen, it doesn't take long. Slow down. 
Some of you just need to slow down, take a breath. Some of you are so busy, you're missing these moments, these, these divine moments that God has for you to reach out and touch somebody's life. You're so busy, you're in such a hurry, you miss that person at the marketplace, you miss that person in the workplace. When God's got them primed, I mean like the, it's just ready for something to happen, you just walk right by them because you're so busy. Or you're scared, or pride's in the way, whatever it might be. God's been working in their heart and their life to bring them to this place, and you just went right by them. God, I want to be a stretcher bearer. Second point I want to catch this from this is we need people who are willing to realize their need for a Savior. And that's first and foremost to those of you perhaps who've been religious but you haven't given your life to Jesus completely. And second of all, it's for Christians who have given their life to Jesus to realize if they're going to be a stretcher bearer, they need Jesus even more. To be their strength, to be their boldness, to be their security, to be their, their power. Amen? We need Jesus. I cannot do anything without Jesus. The scripture makes clear, Jesus told me that. Without me, you can do nothing. I need my Savior. I need Jesus to be everything in me today. I need Jesus to be my life. I need Jesus to be my courage. I need Jesus to be my motivation. I need Jesus to be my burden. I need, I, I just, I want to be used by God. I want to make a difference in the world I live in. Are you willing? The Lord's ready. Isn't it interesting that these miracles that Jesus is doing in the first of his ministry, every one of them is, is making a declaration to call people to something, to see the importance that, hey, he came to be fishers of men, and, and, and first of all, that miracle of change and the water and the wine, and then, then he calls others to join in that same ministry of seeing people's lives changed, and then here he looks around and he sees these four guys who are willing to be, uh, go out of the way to make a difference in somebody else's life, you know. And then, then we see what it's all really all about and seeing people's lives change, the people we bring. It, it, every one of these miracles are wrapped in such an important lesson. And, and it, you'll see as we go through them how it keeps progressing. And we need to keep progressing. We need to keep being what God's called us to be. Would you stand with your heads bowed this morning?